The rule is the leader must not fall. It was considered very impolite. In fact, they considered it so impolite that they would take their hemp rope, the belayer, the second, would put it over a sharp piece of rock. And if the leader were so rude as to fall off, they could break the rope and save the rest of the party. Chouinard became the manufacturer and he'd make a few of these in the chicken coop and then throw them in the trunk of his car and he'd go to the Tetons, he'd go to the valley and and one of these, I mean, his early ones cost a dollar and a quarter. So it was, it's like I could eat for two days for that, but, um, but give me three of them because <laughs> there's nothing like them in the universe and I already broke one of those <laughs> soft iron pins. So I'm a believer now. This is exciting. We're gonna get a history lesson on climbing <laughs> gear. So, uh, once upon a time, <laughs> all climbing was soloing. <laughs> yeah, I guess that's true. Um, no, it's really, really exciting that we have an opportunity to hear Doug's stories because he's been climbing for 65 years. <laughs> what was it? 62 years. 62 years. Don't exaggerate. <laughs> don't, don't, don't need to. <laughs> he's gonna talk about from pitons to nuts to friends, and he's got a whole show and tell for us here. I started climbing in 1958. I was 13 years old. There were no, just commercial climbing schools in California. I guess the Tetons was the closest one, Rainier maybe. And I was stoked, because these guys, these Silicon Valley nerds who were teaching me were so much fun, they loved puns, and so, I could get into their sense of humor right away. And you know, and they had their baggy army surplus pants, and these big old army surplus boots that they claimed were climbing shoes, and I didn't know any better. And it was so really fun to go out on the sandstone at Castle Rock State Park, um, which is between Silicon Valley, where I grew up, except it wasn't called that yet, and Santa Cruz. Uh, and it's actually high quality sandstone, really fun climbing but you know i didn't know it was the only rock i'd ever been on and when that was cool the people were cool the lessons were good i learned i tied onto a rope wrap it around your waist and tie a bowl and you're on belay <laughs> don't fall did you ever fall on a rope like that like oh yeah oh did yeah you still have your ribs uh <laughs> yeah <laughs> I feel like that would break your ribs. I broke a rib in a ski accident about that same time. <laughs> but Is this the rope that you would tie into? Yeah. No. But is this uh, the type of rope. This is a hemp rope. Yeah. Or Manila was the good quality hemp okay. from Manila in the Philippines. But um, I bought this out of the hardware store just so I could show what old rope used to be like because it's the three-strand construction. Um, but they didn't hold a lot. They would break at under 2,000 pounds. And if you do the math, that's a person falling 10 feet. It's about enough to break this rope. Do they have stretch? No. So like They actually have, they, um, I just saw this number the other day. It's like 12, 13% at failure. At failure, well, yeah, at failure. <laughs> you know, so it was basically jerk you around if you fell on it. So you would get high forces with such a static. You'd rate. get a high force, and that's one of the reasons that they would break with a person falling only 10 feet, you know, which led the old British mountaineers very reasonably to say, the rule is the leader must not fall. It was considered very impolite. In fact, they considered it so impolite that they would take their hemp rope, the belayer, the second, would put it over a sharp piece of rock. And if the leader were so rude as to fall off, they could break the rope and save the rest of the party. That sounds rude but in it its own way. But it put it <laughs> an understandable cap on the progression of difficulty of climbing. 
I mean, soloing did too before that, obviously, right? And the rope came into use in uh, the earliest part of the 20th century. They were lassoing knobs and stuff with it before that. It was kind of the old tricks. But to actually belay, which they didn't obviously know much about if they were putting it over a sharp rock, <laughs> um, to actually belay came in in the, well, 100 years ago, a little more. And once they got the rope going, they're thinking, well, if the leader does fall off, and maybe I can hold him standing on this ledge, but he might just rip me off here and we'll both go down. And that didn't seem recommended. So they got nails at first, and pitons, of course, came into existence. In Austria, they were kind of the tech leaders at the time. And once you got a piton, well, it's got a ring on it. You can untie the rope, the ball on around my waist, thread it through, tie it back on. There are a few stances where you might think about putting a piton in where that might not work. Wait, when did carabiners come into the scene? Oh. <laughs> yeah, the Austrians, once again, the tech leaders. Here's an old Austrian carabiner. It's kind of a nice gait on it. I like that. Um, and this is not that old, but it's old enough. Pins in the... Um, anyway, of course, with the carabiner, I mean, you guys all know how this works because you're modern climbers, but you can clip the carabiner in and then clip your hemp rope. So this was revolutionary approximately when we were going to the moon. No, uh, <laughs> I'm like, it just doesn't seem like my history is right. <laughs> okay, no, it was like 1910. Oh, okay. 1910, 1920, that decade. So they had cars the figured out. But this yeah. was revolutionary. Cars made, meant you could get to the crags, <laughs> right? Ah. <laughs> right? This is the first revolution in climbing was cars. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah early 1900s um, this stuff was being developed and hemp rope manila rope in the 30s there were a few silk ropes and silk has a single strand of silk will stretch 22 percent at failure it's a nice stretchy rope but they're expensive and you know the french had them but they wouldn't let anybody else use them meanwhile the brits because the Austrians invented pitons, immediately said, well, that's unsporting. You can't anchor yourself to the wall. You know, huh, why would anybody do that? <laughs> we're sportsmen here. So they were behind the times for 30, 40 years. Um, but they were leading some damn hard stuff in England on practice rocks because that's what anybody assumed that crag climbing was at the time, was just, this is just practice to go to the Alps and do real climbing, alpine climbing. So, okay, so the Brits, and I just happen to have a demo here. Check this out. Machine nut, 1950s. They're, these guys are good, like, Joe Brown and Don Willens are the hottest climbers in the world at the time. And they're walking up the tracks of the Snowden Railway to go to Cenotaph Corner, which was maybe the hardest climb of the 1950s. And they find a machine nut on the tracks. It's like rattled off one of the engines of the railway. And- How'd they come up with the name nuts? <laughs> <laughs> Machine nut. <laughs> so they could actually, before that, they had pebbles. They'd fill their pockets with pebbles. They'd, they'd go up with their rope and go, all right, I want some pro here. Pro, bro. They'd put the rope into the crack, pull a, just the right size little stone out of their pockets. They'd put it into the crack in front of the rope so that if they fell the rope would go over the stone right and 
chalk stones, which is another old name for nuts. How's the second person clean that? Do they take the rocks out and throw them down? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Rock. <laughs> Nut. Yeah. <laughs> So of course it didn't it didn't take long before they started putting nuts on slings and and they would wear them over their their neck like this maybe okay. several of them maybe several different nuts on one piece of cord Oh that's actually a good idea Yeah different sizes you know how many times have you pulled the wrong size nut off your rack and you're shaking there on the wall going oh no it doesn't fit Only twice per move <laughs> Right uh, So what year? Where are we at? Oh, we're we're 1950s here. All right, so we're modern. <laughs> we're totally modern, but because Piton's been around for 40 years at this point. Yeah, 1910s somewhere in there. Okay. And Carabiner maybe 1920. Super modern. Super modern. But still hemp ropes. You know, you can't trust the rope for much. Um, but when I started climbing in 1958, nobody in California had heard of this. Word traveled really slowly. There are no climbing magazines. I mean, zero at the time. You know, there are no videos traveling across when, the Atlantic. When did YouTube start? <laughs> uh, we'll have to get a tech expert to tell us about that. <laughs> Not my department. Wait, what made you like rock climbing if you didn't see it on Instagram? <laughs> That's one of those. Uh, I'm sorry. I'll have to refer that to my Zen master. <laughs> Zen master. Like, did you? It's see just rocks? so much fun. Did Come on. Did you see rocks and see people climb it and go, "That's what I want to do," or did you like not see people climb it and you just like naturally wanted to go up there? No, I was so lucky because I moved to California when I was four, and when I was five, my parents started taking me to Yosemite mm -hmm. to go camping, and then. There, walking around and then we're scrambling up and down peaks and um and when you once you're scrambling peaks yeah. the question arises of like maybe i need a rope here <laughs> oh, i wish i had a rope um so i went to the people who had ropes and they taught me how to use them they were nylon ropes by then oh. world war ii Nylon was invented by DuPont in 1938, okay? It immediately got commandeered by the military and they made the first real nylon climbing ropes and used them. The 10th Mountain Division in World War II used them. So civilians didn't get their hands on them until army surplus. Nice olive drab ropes. Same three-strand construction all ropes had ever been. And they were cool. Suddenly they would hold two tons, more than two tons. You could hang a pickup truck from them. How big were they? Were they like 11 mil thick? They were 11 mil, yeah. 11 was, I mean, nine was considered too sketchy at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, so the, like if you just take Yosemite, which is kind of a cool place to climb, before World War II, the biggest climbs were one-day climbs like the Royal Arches or like the Higher Cathedral Spire or the Lost Arrow even got climbed. Pretty bold. But you're back in camp in the evening. And in 1947, all of a sudden that jumped to a five-day climb on the Lost Arrow chimney. Radical. Second ascent wasn't done for five years after that, but in 1950, same guys, John Salafe, brilliant innovator, and he, uh, in 1950, he grabbed Alan Steck, who was a teenager, and they did the North Face of Sentinel Rock, the Steck Salafe, right? Um, also brilliant, really hard climb. They, it was almost all aid then. And Salathe made the first hard steel pitons ever, right? So this stuff, which we consider junk now, but um, is soft iron. And you, um, you pound it into a crack in the rock and it'll bend to fit the crack. 
which is a good thing. Like in the Italian Dolomites, the cracks are all wobbly, and you pound a piton in there, and it's going to stay. It's not coming out either. So you leave the ground with quite a few pitons, and put them in and leave them. Which incidentally led to the first thoughts of clean climbing, or maybe it was because Salathay's hard steel pitons, the rumor is they were made out of Model A axles, probably true, uh, were expensive. And so that plus a, the beginnings of a clean climbing ethic led to pounding them back out. Well, a second takes a pin out, we'll take it with us. Now maybe I only need a dozen pins to do the Stex Alethe, which is fortunate because even Salathe himself only had 15 of them at that point, <laughs> you know. He was a wrought iron worker, though. He was, he was a blacksmith. He, he knew what he was doing. Um, and he knew that he needed hard steel for this because he... For Yosemite cracks. For Yosemite cracks. Like, yeah, I mean, I, like, here's... I don't have to show you all my old stash of old pitons, but this is a, a Cassin. This is like, you could buy these for 30 cents when I started climbing, so I had a few of them. But I took one of these and pounded it in for aid in Yosemite, just a little crack near the ground. I'm going to try out direct aid. And uh, the last hit with the hammer, the head broke off it. Hmm. Off the piton. Off the piton. Not confidence inspiring. Um, but this is like the soft iron pitons. They're just cranked out of junk metal. So Salathe came up with these radically strong pitons that you could actually pound in really hard because you're probably scared and then second would pound them back out and they, um, and you could pound them again and again and again and again and again and they kept working. Except, of course, that they chipped the edges of the cracks, which um, was maybe not so clean. And later on, that was one of the big motivators for the whole clean climbing revolution going to nuts. So where did Chenard come into the picture if Salathe was making hard iron pitons? And what year is that? Chenard came onto the scene in 1958 in a chicken coop in his parents' backyard in Burbank and started, he, well, he, he was a falconer, so he got started climbing, climbing up to falcon nests to steal chick, falcon chicks. Um, and then Pretty soon he was in the Tetons doing hard routes and, you know, the rest is history. But he had probably bought a few Salathe Petons from Salathe himself and went, hmm, I got a hammer, forge, I might be able to do this. And, of course, he could, and he did. And his Salathe had actually quit climbing at that point. Um, so here's a Chenard Piton. Um, it says Lost Arrow on it. And it has a Diamond C, which is his mark. Interestingly, Salathe's mark for his Peninsula Ironworks was a diamond with a P inside it. So Chenard got the idea for the Pitons and for the mark from Salathe and since Salathe wasn't doing this anymore, um, Chenard became the manufacturer and he'd make a few of these in the chicken coop and then throw them in the trunk of his car and he'd go to the Tetons and he'd go to the valley and, and one of these, I mean, his early ones cost a dollar and a quarter. So it was, it's like I could eat for two days for that, but, um, but give me three of them because... <laughs> There's nothing like them in the universe, and I already broke one of those 
soft iron pins. So I'm a believer now. And put this on my rack and the more scared I get, the harder I pound on it. Yeah. So essentially yeah. costs what the cost to us for a cam today would cost two days of food for a hippie. Yeah, I guess that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, happen to have an early Chenard carabiner here too. It's a beautiful thing. Um, that he scraped together the money to get Alcoa to um, turn out the blanks for this and then they you know put the put the gates on them but not a lot of finishing work doesn't look like they're tumble polished <laughs> well may have been tumbled and polished at one time but <laughs> it's been on my rack <laughs> yeah so of course it you know you know how well maybe you don't know how this works and and i'm going to pound one of these for you because it's interesting historically and you know, sooner or later you're going to run into a fixed piton on a clon, right? Here it is in the crack. You just see the head of the thing sticking out. You wonder, yeah, I, well, I can't quite fit a cam in next to that or anything. So I wonder, should I clip into it? Looks kind of rusty. Um, but once you've heard the sound of a piton tightening in a crack in the rock, you know it forever. and you can just test it with a carabiner just by tapping on it and you can tell how tight it is in the rock and whether you can trust it or not. It's pretty simple. Kind of old school. Chenard went on. He very quickly started making angle pitons too. This is the standard angle, three quarter inch, the first size that he made. Larger and smaller of course came along soon soon in terms of years. I mean, there's so few people climbing and that we're not even widely, but completely universally considered to be nuts by anyone uh, who has felt themselves unlucky enough to run into climbers. You know, they, they're curious too, but they also wanted you to know that you were crazy. No question. Um, These stories remind me of highlining but instead of every decade it's like every two years in, right. in our world because the internet makes things just happen faster now totally the way that one person starts making the gear and then somebody else kind of gets a lot of the same ideas but they are the ones who take off with the business yeah and then people think we're crazy and now it's like oh I know what slacklining is and it's slowly getting traction and we feel like we're in the 70s of climbing. It really is getting traction. So, uh, it, it resonates with me so much to hear the climbing history. Huh. But this, the history stretched out over 100 years. Yeah. And in like five years, slackline is just going to be so much different than it is today. When climbing's also exploding with climbing becoming more popular. I mean, YouTube changed everything forever. Yeah. But, but the in the late 50s... There was not even a climbing magazine. And then there was a backpacker hiker magazine that would have a climbing article once in a while. It was called Summit. And in the mid-60s, Royal Robbins became their climbing editor. And so all of a sudden, there'd be a Royal article every month or every two months. And, and so then you had to start looking at this hiker magazine because it was the only information you could find. So enough of pitons, but interesting to know that we had pro. I mean, 1957, the year I started climbing, was the first ascent of the north face of Half Dome, northwest face. You know, Royal Robbins, Jerry Galwas. I always forget who the third guy was. Sorry, third guy. Uh, five days on the face, second attempt, and that was the first grade six climb in the world. Walls just as big and the Dolomites were done, but like nine hours you could climb a 3,000 foot wall in the Dolomites, especially if you didn't have to bother to take your pitons out with you. <laughs> um, so anyway, huge breakthrough. So Yosemite's on the cutting edge. But interesting side light, we've got nylon ropes then, but nobody's willing to fall. 
because we have this whole backlog of climbing history when, you know, the leader must not fall. And it was ingrained in not just my head, but the whole of climbing culture felt that. Like, yeah, I, the test report on this nylon is good and it's got the same stretch as the silk ropes that were highly prized in the 30s, like 23% at failure. They're really stretchy. I know that, that they'll let me down easy, but let, <laughs> let go, fall off the rock, or do something so hard that I'll probably fall? No. Uh -uh. So like by the late 50s, 5'8", it was maybe getting into 5'9", the hardest stuff that was being done. And nobody was falling off it people were pretty confident before they did those climbs so it wasn't until 64 that which incidentally was about when 510 came in the very first um, that people were willing sort of to take falls i mean nobody's willing to fall any any time but but nowadays you you have to fall or you can't push grades just part of the deal but it's interesting to know that it took 20 years after the nylon rope arrived before people trusted it enough or trusted themselves enough the belays were good um, sitting hip belay on a ledge no problem but um, anyway it just took a long time for the trust to get there enough and part of the trust was trusting the pitons and the carabiners and the rope itself. But anyway, it happened and things really began to accelerate about 1964. Um, I feel like that culture of don't fall in Yosemite still happens. Like I started in 2005 in Yosemite and I, I've taken very few lead falls because as a leader in Yosemite with cans and stuff, like you don't trust the gear. I, I trusted the rope, but the culture, whoever taught me, it was always, huh. the leader doesn't fall. Yeah. Now sport climbing, if that's where you learn, like of course that's okay because it's quick draws and ropes and climbing gyms, you're like used to that. But if you start in Yosemite and that's all you ever know, that's what I learned. I think you're saying fall. that you have to wear lycra to be able to fall. You have to wear what? Lycra. <laughs> Lycra. <laughs> Sorry, that's going back to the oh, 80s. Yes, but when yes, sport yes, climbing yes, got yes, got yes, invented, yes, there yes. happened to be brightly colored Lycra tights that oh, yeah. people, people would wear. People, uh, it's a thing now still. You know, yeah. and it made a divide. Like there were the traddies and there were the sport climbers. And <laughs> like Ron Kauk's famous line was, John Wayne never wore Lycra. Yeah. <laughs> so... Yeah, it's super interesting to hear that was the, how much uh, past culture still affects yeah, future boy. teachings. Yeah. I mean, the cutting edge of free and L cap, people take falls all the time. Yeah, when you watch Don Wall and just the <sighs> giant whippers Tommy will take yeah. over and over, and you're just like, I didn't know ropes. I thought they were UIA rated for seven falls. I was like, who's bringing them up fresh ropes every seven falls? No kidding. <laughs> and you read the rope pamphlet and it says, once you take a fall on it, you untie, you let the rope rest for five minutes. This is the official word. And then you can tie back in and lead with it. <laughs> yeah, Tommy. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know how many factor one falls a rope can take before it breaks? Because we know what a, a factor two is how many, but how many factor ones? Well, we know how many 1.7 falls because that's what the test tower actually is. That's the UIAA is yeah. 1.7. So it's printed on, you know, well, we're gonna every find rope. Out. It's like the one number that everybody reads on the little card that comes on the yeah. ropes. It's oh, how many falls is it rated for? You know, okay, that's good. What color is it? I'm buying it. <laughs> so we're going to find out with our drop tower that we're building because... We all know what 1.7 factors are, but not <laughs> 1.0s. That's excellent. I really want to see those test results. We're gonna... I mean, what you guys are doing with the tower is so cool. 
Yeah, cause... because I'm going to probably use me as the <laughs> as the dummy. <laughs> <laughs> So, all right. so okay. So that reminds me of a story. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Sorry about that, but story time. Yeah. So it's the 1930s, hemp ropes, but the Sierra Club, the predecessors of the guys who taught me, were really on it because they were climbing in Yosemite, you know, and they realized that falls could happen. So they went out to Cragmont Rock in Berkeley, with their hemp ropes. And what triggered this story is you're talking about you being the test subject, yeah. right? <laughs> and they would do practice falls off of Cragmont Rock, off overhangs on Cragmont Rock. And so they were developing a thing called, they called the dynamic belay, which means that the belayer slides the rope a little as he's holding on their hips. the leader on his hip. Yeah, no kidding. Well, <laughs> big leather pads, <laughs> hip pads. Okay. When I literally, we had dynamic belay practice um, when when I got started, and and point is, they never would have been able to hold such gigantic falls, let alone with a real person on the end of it trusting them without a dynamic belay. So they were sliding the rope and the rope was raising smoke off the leather pads that they were wearing. Uh, I mean, it was serious stuff. And they published this beautiful little booklet about it um, called Belaying the Leader. They were leading the world in understanding the forces involved right then. So cool. We got trained that way by the Sierra Club climbers to slip the rope a little bit. It's not actually easy to do, um, but it's still done, for instance, with a boot axe belay on snow. You want to slip the rope a little because how much is your ice axe going to hold, even with your boot up against the ed edge of it? There's a limit. So it's 1958. I'm 13. Um, three Sundays a, a month, we'd go to Castle Rock and go rock climbing. The fourth Sunday, we'd go down to a creek bed where they had um, the dynamic belay set up. And here's how it worked. There's like a 150 pound cement weight, a separate rope, and they haul it up the big ass oak branch with a pulley and a trip bar. So, and and then they would kindly put some slack in the rope. The rope would run up over a pulley, not even a carabiner, and down. And so I'm tied to the bumper of a Volkswagen there. I've got this big leather pad, gloves. I'm on belay, ready to go. And they trip the lever. The concrete sails towards the creek bed. I get into position. Hold on, you're 13 and you're I'm trying 13. to catch a 150 I'm scrawny pound too. block of concrete. Yeah, yeah, they didn't have lighter ones for well, you know. <laughs> the Sierra Club leaders weighed that much, so <laughs> they wanted to know I could belay them. Um, <laughs> and I, and I <laughs> held the block for a while, and smoke's rising off the leather, and then then it's too much, and the concrete crashes into the creek bed and I know that I'll never be a real climber because I can't hold real falls. <laughs> I don't even know if I could catch a 150 pound block of concrete. <laughs> Contrasting story. Now it's early 60s. Actually stayed with climbing. Been at it a few years. My partner is leading Bishop's Terrace. This is what the climbing guide at the time called an appalling series of jam cracks. They were 5'8". And he comes off in the cracks. Well, I'm, the rope runs down the cliff through a couple of pitons, several, and off to the side. And I'm sitting on a ledge, but it's a downsloping ledge. And by that time, we'd actually gotten kind of casual about belaying because we'd been doing it for a while. And um, So I had a foot and a half of slack in my... Um, anchor. My partner fell 30 feet, most of it free. But by the time the fall got to me, there was 
and through the stretch in the rope, this magic climbing rope, the only there was only enough force left to gently pull me down this down sloping ledge until my anchor came tight and that's it. No smoke, no fireworks. It was an easy catch. So the contrasting experience, the whole difference was basically nylon rope. Were you disappointed when you found out you were safer than you thought? <laughs> <laughs> That's how I feel about bolt busters. When we realized we were bolt. safe. Yeah, yeah, that's what we call when we break the bolts. Cool. When I found out the bolts are stronger than we thought, I was like, oh, we're not as badass as I thought we were. Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> we thought quarter inch bolts with leaper hangers, which have all been recalled, were. Yeah, I clip into that. It's so bomber. No problem ever. So you're saying we took falls on those. Don't name gear after yourself in case it's recalled for the rest of uh, <laughs> forever. <laughs> Poor Ed Leeper. <laughs> I mean, he was really a good engineer and he was very conscientious. And he called, blew the whistle on his own gear and said, please stop using this. And there are all these bolts all over <laughs> the country. <laughs> you know, these fat quarter inch bolts, man. Couldn't do any better. They're an inch and a quarter long, too. <laughs> But anyway, the, a couple of hangers had actually disintegrated in falls, apparently. I never saw one. We kept on using them because it was a while before even bolt replacement, or let alone 3 8 bolts, got going. So we're, it's bomber. But was I scared? Sure, I was scared all the time, but I wasn't really scared that the rope would break or that the hardware would break or come out it because it held how did the rope hold when you were belaying if you were holding it on a sharp edge for your for your climber <laughs> <laughs> okay wait or technique you, it advanced a little <laughs> were you not were you not belaying properly and putting it on a sharp corner for your climber i i was doing a very proper hip belay that the <laughs> The Sierra Club guys had taught me how to do. I mean, it was the most advanced belay we had. Their belay device. In case he fell. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the bowling was more of a problem than the hip belay. But I think it was T.M. Herbert was leading on the Lost Arrow, the Lost Arrow chimney, and he looked down just in time to see his rope snaking out from at that point we were advanced to the point where we had wraps of one inch webbing around our waist and the rope was tied to that so it was snaked out of his swami belt we called him and uh, he had to stand there very quietly on his holds for an hour before one of his partners could lead up to him and tie him back in so you know, it was a huge advance when we got the figure eight knot man we got it you know it's like whew. That was the last sketchy thing in climbing. <laughs> so Advances keep happening, you know, and that one, that was such an interesting one, the figure eight knot. Tetons were revolutionary at some point in history. And then Very. ropes in literally nuts were revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, when did they really take off? Well, in the mid 60s is the short answer to that. But of course, I have a longer answer for you. Let's hear it. 